watching QTV Broadcasting from The Gambia and this is the news with me, Antoine Isoyasi. Our headlines. The President has delivered his latest State of the Nation address setting out his government's agenda. The 84 day of hearings at the TRRC had contrasting witness statements about the consequences of the Australian demonstrations of April 2000. As reports of land and resources conflicts increase, a welcome peace-building workshop has taken place. And despite health warnings, the chemical sniper is still being sold and used as a pesticide. Stay tuned as we bring you more on this and other stories. <music> President Adam Abaro on Thursday delivered the State of the Nation address at the National Assembly outlining his government's policy and programs. As Alusisi reports, President Barrow used the occasion to call for national unity for sustainable development. President Adama Barrow appeared before deputies and invited guests to deliver his first State of the Nation address since his election in 2016. His marathon statement highlighted government's achievements and challenges during the year under review, and as well plans across all sectors for the coming year. Government attaches great importance to every public institution and sector because any sector that fails to perform well could undermine the performance of other sectors and the nation at large. On the education sector, he said efforts are underway to upgrade the Gambia Technical Training Institute into a university. However, critics suggest that more focus will be directed at improving the quality of teaching and learning at the University of the Gambia. He revealed that government plans to build more schools across the country to ensure universal access to education. The education sector continues to be given priority by government in view of its centrality in the development process. This priority is demonstrated by the heavy investments in our two education subsectors and their programs. The issue of women, children and disabled is yet remain key on the agenda of the government, which will continue to ensure the protection of their rights and participation in decision making processes. On internal security, Barrow reported that there has been steady progress to ensure security despite an increase in the number of murders and robberies in the country. In December 2018, 541 personnel were trained on protection, track control, and management. The European Union has expanded this by supporting the security sector reform process to the tune of 1.5 million euros and has trained 40 officers. The government, he went on, is reviewing the ICT Act and existing draconian media laws among other things under the information and communication sector. In the area of justice, he renewed his government's commitment to the rule of law and democracy, saying the government is reviewing the criminal procedure code and will soon table the anti-corruption bill. While thanking Gambians for their support, President Barrow capped off his speech by calling on Gambians to be law-abiding and promote peace and unity. However, he fell short of mentioning anything relating to the three years or five years issue regarding his tenure as president. I call on all Gambians to join us in the healing, reconciliation, and reconstruction process that is in progress. Let us unite as a nation and work together as a people, primarily as brothers and sisters in, in a family. We must not allow politics or any other worldly affairs to separate us. We are all human beings and Gambians first before anything else. As we look forward to the third republic, my government has sown the seeds of success for the rebirth of the Gambia. I pray that Allah help us all the way to achieve our noble goals. The parliament will resume on Monday when MPs will scrutinize the president's speech and debate its contents. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alusis. More witnesses continue to appear before the Commissioners of the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission on the students' demonstrations in 2000 which led to the killings of unarmed students. Two witnesses appeared on Thursday among them is the CEO of the Royal Victoria Teaching Hospital during the students' demonstration. Babu Karsi was there and he now reports.
Thursday marks the end of another week of the ongoing Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission's hearing, with two more witnesses appearing to narrate their contrasting experiences of April 10th 11th student demonstration. The first to appear was Mohamed Sajau, a father who lost his son, Amadou Sajau, at Old Joswang. According to him, paramilitary officers were firing at students who were running for their lives, at his main compound, onlookers and neighbors standing at the gate ran to his house when paramilitary officers opened fire on them. In the process of running for their lives, the child was on the veranda playing when the crowd running trampled on him, causing his death. So as we were there, my child who was uh, behind them playing, then we had three gunshots almost uh, simultaneously. So those people that were standing at the uh, gate, they rushed into the compound and uh, they knocked down the child. I attempted to rescue the child, but I could not because the people that were coming were many, and so they were stamping on him until they all crossed over before I could reach to him to help. When I picked up the child, I saw that he was stretched. According to Mr. Sajau, there were efforts for the victims who had lost their loved ones to come together and pursue the matter, but later it was announced that the incident that would not be investigated or taken further and relatives did not pursue the case further. Next to appear was Dr. Maria Tujalo, Chief Executive Officer of the RVTH in 2000. Dr. Jalo told the commission that she was the boss of the hospital with responsibility for making final decisions. Dr. Jalo recalled the April 2000 student demonstration in which her attention was called to the amount of people coming in with gunshot wounds. The death toll was 14, whom she recalled were taken to the mortuary whilst the injured were being treated in various parts of the hospital. Dr. Jalo went on to explain that she received directives from State House that no patient should be given his or her medical record. Well, this was an unusual situation where we were, we were given instructions not to allow patients to have those records. Who gave those instructions? The instructions would come from the State House and I will assume that it's from the former president. She said the situation at the time would not allow her to disobey the instructions coming from State House as her life could have been in danger for not executing the orders of Yaya Jame. She confirmed the visit of the former president Jame to the hospital to check on the victims and agreed that the situation as if all was okay to the president when in reality Things were out of hand, especially in dealing with the number of the injured victims. The victims, she said, were not happy with Jame's visit to the hospital, with one of them refusing to talk to him. On the issue of the injured boys that were taken to Egypt for a three-month treatment, only for the government or the responsible authorities to pay only a month's treatment fee and leaving them without any support, she had this to say. So I want to say to you, as an individual, you pardon me if there's any time you felt that I was unkind or I did not do what I was supposed to do. In terms of your medical attention, I made sure that you had the best that was available. But administratively, I was unable to do more than I did. So I would like to say that I, I feel pain. I feel pain because I did my best and probably my best was not good enough for you. When the three boys returned from Egypt with their medical treatment not completed, Dr. Jalo took their medical papers at the airport under a directive from State House, which she knew was wrong at the time, but felt unable to disobey even unlawful orders coming from the State House. Dr. Maria Tujalo ended her testimony on the issue of the April 10th 11 incident 
and she is expected to reappear before the commissioners at a later date to talk about Yaya Jame's HIV AIDS treatment program. Was the treatment program truthful or was it a hoax? It was a hoax. It was a lie. It was a lie. And the doctors who participated in that knew it was a lie. Yes. Babu Karsi, QTV News. Sniper, an agrochemical pesticide, is popularly used in the Gambia despite health warnings. Despite a joint moratorium in February 2019 by the National Environment Agency and the Health Ministry, the product can still be picked up easily on the streets. Ajifatu Bindubub has more. Sniper has been used as the most effective method of driving away insects, including mosquitoes, cockroaches, and more. On the bottle, it is clearly written that it is meant for outdoor use. However, due to ignorance of health dangers, many Gambians use it as an indoor insecticide. Omar Esba, Registrar of Pesticides at the National Environment Agency, says the product is still under investigation in terms of whether there should be an outright ban. More about the sniper issue, so that finally we will come up with a decision either to finally ban or lift the moratorium that has been imposed earlier this year. The NEA Program Officer of Hazardous Chemicals and Pesticides, Bybite, says it is important for people to know the chemical products they use. Let them be reading the labels and then make sure that those that are selling it to them explain what the label entails to them. And then for those that are in the, in the, in the streets, like we call them mostly street pesticides or street vendors, you, will see, you can see them in the country, they will be roaming from house to house. That is in fact illegal. It's illegal. Before you engage in the business of pesticides, you should be licensed by the agency. Any person that is engaged in the business without a proper license is doing something which is illegal. The market vendors say they are not aware of the moratorium, but the authorities sometimes seize the chemicals from their shops. They complain that seizing the products will not enforce the moratorium when it is still being imported in the country. Paul Okpara, a market vendor, says Sniper it's not the only harmful product found in the markets. The problem is just to sensitize people on how to use it. I, saying somebody drank it and he died, the person chose to die. The person chose to die. The person can as well drink acid. If you drink acid, he will die. If he, there are so many things in the market, even soda, even caustic soda, if you put it inside a tumbler and put water there and drink it, you, you die. According to experts, Exposure to the chemical can cause irritation of the eye and skin, headaches, vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, and cardiac irregularity, amongst other symptoms. Since prevention is better than cure, and given its clear harmful effects on humans, it is to be hoped that people with disease from using the sniper product as an indoor insecticide or that the authorities enforce the moratorium sooner rather than later. Ajifatu Bintumbu, QTV News. Meanwhile, Gambia joined the rest of the world to celebrate World Ozone Day. The day is set aside by the United Nations to create awareness on the dangers created by ozone depletion. Lamindabo reports. <laughs> The ozone layer provides a protective seal for plant and animal life from the sun's ultraviolet radiation, which can be harmful particularly to living organisms. The International Day for the Preservation of the Ozone Layer is celebrated to highlight and find solutions to tackling substances that deplete the ozone layer. The executive director of NEA, Dudu Trawale, explains that some of our electric household materials emit gases are harmful to the environment. Thank you. 
Mr. Trawale further explains how the National Environment Agency is making the public aware. The Deputy Director, Dr. Dauda Baji, says the NEA were able to achieve a lot through support from their partners, especially the United Nations agencies. He went on to explain the dangers posed by depletion of the ozone layer. Without the ozone layer, we experience an increase in the prevalence of skin cancer, eye cataract, reduced agricultural productivity, and de de disruption of marine ecosystem. The Director of Research and Development, Njagature, calls for attitudinal change towards our environment. It is important that uh, it is disseminated all over the country so that people know that the Gambia is also part of the celebrations of the World Ozone Day. Uh, because, I mean, uh, what happens in the ozone layer has no boundary. And whatever we do have an implication in our lives and our livelihood. So on that note, this is a joint effort that not only NEA is doing, but all the other stakeholders concerned, ranging from the international partners who I mentioned here, particularly the United Nations Environment Program, uh, UNIDO, and the GF, who are the major funders of this activity. World Ozone Day celebrates the progress in protecting the ozone layer and moves to phase out ozone depleting chemicals, which also emit potent greenhouse gases. Reporting for QTV News, Lamin Alive Funding Dabo. And from the report by Lamin Dabo, we take a short commercial break. We will be right back. Light. From the beginning of time, light has been there. It is integral to our survival and to our way of living. We need light to work. To build. To grow things and even to see our loved ones. Light makes things easier and better. So QCell has changed the way you buy QPower to make it easier and more accessible. You can now access the same service quickly and get your cash power tokens instantly with the new QCell QPower code. To light up your world, simply dial star 363 hash. With the touch of your fingers, with ease and convenience from the comfort of your home or office, you can bring light into your world instantly with star 363 hash. QPower, lighting your world. QCell Sunyabus. We, we innovate, innovate, others, others follow. follow. Sama abakeka, credit ko tebulu, ifan kantata, kiusel, dole silo wara, dole noma. Welcome back. An entire village in Badibu is accustomed to growing pumpkins as cash crop. Despite a boom and bumper harvest, the pumpkin farmers are faced with constraints. Our reporter, Mamudu Gajaga, visited the village and this is his report. A pumpkin farm looking fresh and green. In this village, both young and old have been cultivating this vegetable as a source of living. The trade in selling this produce had been practiced here for over three decades. When I arrived at the village, the first thing I saw was men offloading a fresh harvest of pumpkins from horse and donkey carts. Lamin Jadama is one of the farmers. <laughs> It has been 38 years this year since we've started cultivating pumpkins in this village. Our biggest challenge was that we have to water the plants in May when the rain failed to come until when the rains begin in late June or early July. Yearly, the harvest is very good, but transportation and marketing are challenges they faced. 
Gibbon, the Fogan in Samar Boyla. So all the Catantola do court in Tolun Sangitan Saban in same Ben do call in Gamon. Sang was sung. Dindin Keba, Manke Kebal, the Maraca, Dindin Keba, Musuka for in Gambela Cardo. Sending Kumu Mosa for Jamunjan Satte. Jamunjan Satte old, Neo for no problem. Ah, Jamunjan Satte old. So I'll see Mark. When it comes to marketing our produce, our roads are bad. Hiring a truck all the way to Senegal costs a lot of money. In the same vein, if traders from Senegal come here to buy pumpkins, they buy it at low prices. We end up selling the leftovers at half its normal price at the Farafene market. Mafanta Marong, whose husband, Suleiman Jadama, introduced pumpkin cultivation in the village, is indeed proud of her husband. <laughs> When my husband began cultivating pumpkins decades ago, he wasn't taken seriously. At the time, many people said he was just wasting his time on a vegetable that grows on mostly on dump sites. But today, I can proudly say many are following his footsteps. Almost the entire community live on this as their source of living. They farm pumpkins and sell it to some parts of the Gambian market and the rest would go to neighboring Senegal. This has been a show of living for years. Omudu Gajaga for QTV News in Badibu Jumansar. Meanwhile, a workshop addressing conflicts over land and natural resources in the Gambia was organized by the Ministry of Lands, Regional Government and Religious Affairs in collaboration with the Food and Agricultural Organization. Adjimindu Drame reports. The aim of the workshop is to strengthen the government's efforts in formulating legal framework and enhance mechanism for conflict prevention in communities. More than 70% of the Gambia population make their living from farming, mainly relying on rain-fed agriculture. Over the last two years, conflicts over the control of land and natural resources have become more frequently reported. The project worth 1.4 million US dollars expects to be carried out within 18 months and bound to target all administrative regions. Speaking at the event, Seraphine Wakana, UN resident coordinator, says the proposed intervention in the Gambia will draw on best practice to reduce land conflicts. The Peace Building Fund Office has supported related projects. It was found that key aspects of responsible land tenure systems included the recognition of and protection of legitimate tenure rights against threats and infringement. This enhances communities' capabilities in boosting food security and eradicating poverty. The Minister of Lands, Musa Drame, thanked the project's partners. He says that in the final resolution, there will be mechanisms to regulate the action of the real estate sector to minimize their effects on the landscape. To help track land disputes and establish a data center on all land-related disputes. In addition, this legislation shall also be developed to regulate the activities of real estate sector, thus minimizing their adverse effect on spatial land landscape of the Gambia. It will also avail the state the opportunity to regulate and ensure that real estate business contributes to the economic growth of this country. Ibrahim Ojalo, president of the Livestock Owners Association, says their grazing lands are being turned into residential areas, which is prejudicial to those rearing livestock. He further explains the challenges they face as cattle farmers. A lot. That's why every year we go around to meet the governors and chiefs to talk to them about so that they can leave uh, our animal grazing area. Because if you look at the Gambia, people are competing for land. The land size is not increasing, but the demand is getting higher. So on that, people are intruding to our cattle trucks and then turning it to farms, turning it to a residential area. And then I want my animal to pass, and we say, no, this is my farm, and this, this ends up bringing problems between farmers. But now with the demarcation of lands in the Gambia, 
that every one of us will be able to know what uh, which land belongs to you and how best are you going to manage it. He calls for a solution to be made to avoid land conflicts. Ajibin to Drame, QTV News. And before we end this bulletin of the news, here is a recap of our main stories. The president has delivered his latest State of the Nation address, setting out his government's agenda. The 84th day of hearings at the TRRC had contrasting witness statements about the consequences of the student demonstrations of April 2000. As reports of land and resources conflicts increase, a welcome peace building workshop has taken place. And despite health warnings, the chemical sniper is still being sold and used as a pesticide. That brings us to the end of this edition of the news. Join us tomorrow for more news. Thanks for watching.